This is the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast, episode 116. Whoa, oh, oh, oh. You're listening to the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast, the number one resource for running a profitable home recording studio. Now your hosts, Brian Hood and Chris Graham. Welcome back to another episode of the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast. I am your host, Brian Hood, and I'm here with my bald, beautiful, amazing, purple-shirted co-host, Christopher J. Graham. Chris, how you doing today, my friend? Well, I'm really good, and let me tell you why. We're at NAM. We are in the Vista Room on the 14th floor of the Hilton. We're getting ready to give you guys an episode while we look at Disneyland and mountains in the distance. This uh, is an epic view. We, it's, it's, this is the worst way to describe it. I'm doing a video of look, it right now. Look, a roller now. coaster. It just drove by us. It's pretty crazy. That's crazy. So we're right yeah. across the street from Disney World at the Hilton Hotel where NAM is. We're actively at NAM. It's day three of NAM. It's Saturday. There's a naked person below us in the pool. There is a naked person below us in the pool. So these are all the details that you don't need to know. But what <laughs> does matter is we are at NAM right now and we are having an incredible time. And I'm just glad to be with you, Chris. I'm glad to be with you too, man. This is fun, man. It's By the way, this is the first live in-person interview ever. we have ever done, or episode at all, by the way. I've never recorded in the same room as you for this podcast before. This is true. Yeah, it's always been remote. This is weird. What the hell? You're right. Yeah, 116 episodes in, and this is our first in-person, like, <laughs> first time I've ever talked to you on the podcast in person what before. What the heck? Yeah. Yeah, man. So we're at NAM. It's been wild. We've met so many people that listen to the podcast. My waiter last night was a file pass customer, by the way. Who was not at NAM. It was he wasn't at NAM. This is none real this is like twenty minutes from NAM at Umami Burger. <laughs> so shout out to my waiter at Umami Burger. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, it's been uh wild. You know, we went last year and our podcast wasn't terribly old at the at the time, but it was like weird to meet anyone that listened to us. And now it's just like a non-stop smorgasbord of new friends, which it's true. has been really, really fun. Yeah. This is like, this is the shift of last from last year to now, which is we went to the bottom floor of pro audio, like the big floor for pro audio the first day. And we didn't leave because every like seven steps we've run into somebody we know. And it was like so much fun. I'm still processing that. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of weird. So enough about that. Yeah. So we're having a good time at NAM. Yeah. We're loving it here. Uh, my wife just flew in today, which is amazing. So my wife's going to experience NAM and hopefully not contract NAM thrax. Hilariously, if we had been recording this episode a little earlier when your wife was flying in, her plane, I mean, we can see for like probably a hundred miles out of like it's all windows where we're at and we can see all these mountains. She would have flown over those mountains <laughs> on the way to LAX. We would have seen her fly by. Yeah. Yeah. We Weird. could have used signal mirrors. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> boop, 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 boop. So today we actually have a guest. This is somebody that I just met you. Jesse. We'll, we'll introduce him right here in a second. Met him at NAM. Did you know Jesse before this? Well, I think I met you through Bounce Butler. I think Correct, yeah. you made a story. It was like right after I launched Bounce Butler and you had just had a baby and you put a story up on Instagram about how it was like a picture of you holding your baby and it was something about Bounce Butler was bouncing bounces for you while you went and had family time. And I was like, <laughs> that's, oh my gosh. It, be, it was like exactly why I built Bounce Butler in the first place was so I could hold my baby 10 years ago. And yeah, so it was, just, it was really, really cool. I like got my wife and I was like, look, this guy, oh wow, he's really legit. Yeah. He's like a, like a first rate. So let me try to talk yeah, him up a little bit. It. You're better at this than I am. So I'm going to try my best here. Jesse, no, you're Ray. better at this than I am, Brian. No, you're better at this no. than I am. <laughs> no, you hang up first. <laughs> so Jesse Ray is a Grammy nominated. You're up for a Grammy next week, right? Mixing engineer, audio engineer. What other services do you offer? Well, I'm just mixing now. Okay. Just mixing now. Yes. And he's worked with the likes of Kanye West. Who else? I mean, you know the list better than I do. I'm so bad with lists. Jesse, why don't you tell us a little bit about, for, let's just hand the keys to you. Tell us about your career. This is Jesse Ray from jessieraymix.com. I am 28 years old. I uh, came up in a musical family. Dad was a producer, engineer, mixer guy. Nice. And mom was a songwriter. And yeah, so they kind of nurtured that environment for me. We had instruments in the house and freedom to explore all of that. Uh, played in bands, fast forward right on. through all of that, uh, learned to record. I was the guy who had the gear at the house. So did that moved out to LA a few years ago, was engineering for Kanye West and 
kind of pivoted into mixing after that. So the record I'm up for, a Grammy for, for mixing uh, this next week is Burna Boy, African Giant. Way to go, man. It is so cool to see young people doing well at that at your level. It is, and I feel like an old man saying that. I'm, I'm, like, <laughs> I'm 37. I'm so proud of you. But like, uh, you know, I'm as old as you can possibly be and be a millennial. I kind of have to root yeah, for I millennials. Think, I think once know? they once you were born, they're like, all right, no more millennials are yeah, allowed yeah. to be born. <laughs> that's exactly. how that's how like tight it is in the window there. Yeah, you were the cutoff point. I was the cutoff point. I was the very f- first millennial. <laughs> no, that's not true. <laughs> What kind of, that is such a millennial thing to say. Well, I was the first millennial, like, you know, they just, there was a meeting at the hospital. That should be the headline. And they're like, Gen X has died. (laughs) Oh, I was, I I completely got that wrong. You were, uh, right before you were born, there was no more Gen X's allowed. That's what it was. I completely got that backwards. It's all good. Hopefully we edit it out so no one hears that. classic millennial move, Brian. Don't worry about it. It's all about me. (laughs) Anyways, we're, we're over bantering your story. So we're going to get into the story of how you started working with the Kanye, but I think it's actually important for us to, to get a picture of some of the earlier stuff, because I think one of the reasons I wanted to interview you is because in our conversations, I heard stories of how much of a hustler you were mm-hmm. in a good way to where you were willing to do things that other people were not willing to do. And I think our listeners could get a lot out of hearing some of these stories because a lot of people, our biggest audience is millennial males and millennials are really good at making it about me, 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 me. Mm. Not to offend anybody in our audience if you're a millennial, but a lot of the times we make it about us. Yep. And I think some of the stories you've told me so far are things- Not as much as boomers do, but close. Boomers don't listen to this podcast. <laughs> I'm joking, they do. <laughs> so I want to get some of these stories out of you. And I think it's really good to start early on. You were from Minnesota early on? Yep. Or the Twin Cities area? Uh, tell us about your getting started in that time and kind of that niche you started off in early in your career. Uh, yes. So I found a, a hole in the market where there was a need for engineers to work on college acapella records. And this was right around the time that this group called Pentatonics was getting very, huh. very big and having a lot of success. I would like to state that that's my wife's least favorite band <laughs> On earth. I'm going to put her on blast here. (laughs) Me too. She gets physically angry if she hears them. So it's incredible. Jesse, so it's your least favorite band. It's Brian's wife's favorite band. So the two. No, least favorite band. You're both, it's both of your guys' least favorite band. So you guys are in harmony on that. (laughs) Ooh. Side side note, started started to hijack the story real quick. We're going to get back to you, Jesse. Sure. Uh, We had, uh, if anyone here came to NAM uh, in the Six Figure Home Studio community and you came to that there was a panel called the power of podcasting Mm. and Chris Graham was on and Chris decided to force a pun into the conversation. It wasn't even my turn. It was great. Uh, It wasn't even his turn. Someone (laughs) else was talking. He forced in a pun as Chris does. And I booed him from the audience. It was great. And the audience erupted laugh, in laughter. They got yes, a laugh. Yes, yeah, yes, the yes. boo helped with the laugh. Yes. You, 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 that might have been the only laughing. Yes. Might have been at your boo. Yes, probably. <laughs> Anyways, Jesse, you are in Twin Cities. This was like kind of in the height of Pentatonics when they were up and coming and there was a lot of like acapella groups in your area. Continue the story, sir. Yes. And uh, all of their records uh, were clearly being done by uh, either recording professors at the school or mm. just uh, local I would call them seasoned engineers uh, that were essentially giving them, giving them like a live choir sound. And that's just not the modern sound. Yeah. Like you needed to really layer and stack vocals and blend in samples and just get this really punchy, elaborate, modern production. So to convince the first group to kind of start the domino effect of getting a lot of that work, I just put together a demo that I, I sang the parts myself and structured the harmony out and, and made these kind of artificial drum sounds with my mouth and just like, and it's all really exaggerated. And it's such a hilarious sound, especially now looking back, it's like, wow, this really was ridiculous. So I understand why your, your wife has such, such a dislike for that, that style. It's not, it's not all acapella. It's not all acapella groups. It's just the pentatonics. (laughs) Just them. Yes. Which is amazing because the irony is they're so fantastic when they're just singing in the room. Like it's, they had a, did a documentary on mm. Netflix a, a few years back and I won't be watching it. <laughs> You're really singing their praises here, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you check it out, the first minute is them like backstage prepping just in the rehearsal room before they go on stage. And that's impressive. Then you can turn it off 60 seconds of your life. Yeah. So I threw together this demo and sent it to one of the band leaders and he mm. was kind of the musical director, also a student at the school. And, and I just said, 
I can make your life a lot easier. I can sort of musical direct this and coordinate and I can help with the scheduling and bringing in, you know, the members of your group. And mm. I know how we'll do this and this would be the plan and this is how long it would take and this is what it would cost. And, nice. And at the time it was, most of those groups were funded by the universities. So huh. really? that was great. Really? And I, th yeah. And wow. I, some of them had to kind of fund themselves and do like fundraising concerts and benefit concerts for, at Christmas time. And, but uh, yeah, a lot of it ended up working out nicely like that. Uh, yeah, that took off from there and worked on a lot of that stuff. So you spotted a niche that had a need that was not being filled currently. And was funded. And was funded. Right. That's quite a combo. And then you went out of your way to create an example, a portfolio yourself. That's what I did when I first started. I created like four or five different styles of music with just like little 30 to 60 second clips of songs that I wrote in those genres. And I wanted to show examples of these different types of genres and what I could do with those so that I could prove to somebody that I could do good enough work for their style of music. And the cool thing about the acapella groups is you were saying there was a need that everyone was making them sound like choirs. And if you ever listen to acapella recording, it's a very interesting, like it's very specific needs that they had. And you probably went out of your comfort zone because you're not necessarily an acapella singer yourself. Absolutely. And, and you spent some time on it. You know how much time you spent on doing that? Nights and nights and nights of just being up all night and <sighs> studying and, and researching and figuring out how to do it and emailing the guys who did it. There's a, there's a group of about three or four producers on the East Coast that do all of those records. And one of them was kind enough to send me just a novel of information wow. back. Huh. Do you remember the guy's name? I do, man, I don't. Uh, I would have to dig through an archive of emails, but it was incredibly helpful. Uh, you know, things, all the technical types of things. He probably that, read The Go-Giver. <laughs> yeah, it was extremely generous. Huh. And, and I always remember that and I'm trying to implement that behavior myself now. Yeah, so with that, at the same time, I was doing like a lot of younger engineer producers do is I was working like five different types of jobs, like yeah. offering mixing, mastering. I was giving music lessons. I was gigging and singing and playing guitar in a band, in a country band, because that's what the Midwest market, market kind of looks like. So with that, I knew a bunch of the other country bands. So I kind of did a similar thing where I would, I would make up a, some songs like you did and send them out and be like, hey, here's what I can do. I did the same thing with some of the rock bands and I love this. After a couple of years, I was, you know, I had a portfolio and I had bands that were coming through pretty regularly and it was, it was great. And through the connections I made, I started teaching at Minneapolis Media Institute, a college of recording arts and teaching mixing and engineering courses. And it wasn't long, I think less than a year before that actually closed down. And then the writing was kind of on the wall that the, uh, the move was to get out to LA or Nashville or New York and, my then girlfriend, now wife, Stella and I decided let's, let's do the LA thing. Let's, let's try well, let's, it out. Let's actually dig into that. Cause I think this is a lot of people are in those crossroads right now. It's mm -hmm. like, yeah. my city is not working or I've reached my, my limit. I've hit the ceiling in Reno, Nevada. I shit on that city all the time. It's <laughs> such a trash hole. I've hit the ceiling in Reno, Nevada. What we should do, we should make fun of Fresno, California, because we have history with Fresno when we were on your bachelor party, I'll never forget. We were driving to Yosemite. We were going through Fresno and it was like nine o'clock at night. And I turned my head and I saw a guy driving a bike down the sidewalk, transporting a door on his back <laughs> that he had stolen. And I was like, whoa, what's up, Fresno? <laughs> like, what? You, what are you we can, doing you, here? <laughs> you can blast Fresno. I'm going to continue okay. to blast Reno because <laughs> Reno is one of the saddest cities I've ever been to in Still, Fresno has nothing on Reno. Okay, I'll take your word for yeah, it. So anyways, a lot of people are like, I've hit the ceiling in my city, whether it's Fresno or Reno and, or Athens, Alabama, which is where I'm from. I'll shit in my own town. It's fine. And it's time to move somewhere. Maybe it's Nashville. Maybe it's LA. Maybe it's New York. It shouldn't be New York. Probably I've heard a lot of people say it shouldn't be New York. It shouldn't be a city whose name ends in the word no. Fresno, Reno. <laughs> Sorry, Brian. <laughs> Hell no. Dude. Hell no. Yeah. <laughs> I, can't, I was trying to think of another t another town that ends in the word no. Uh, I, someone someone in their car listening to this podcast is shouting the town I don't, name. I don't want to give you time to think about that. We can't hear you. You're like 10 minutes from now, you're just going to shout out some stupid city name. <laughs> Probably. Out of Probably. context. <laughs> so again, a lot of people are in this. Encino. Is that it? Shut your face. <laughs> that's right. Because what's, what's worse that's about this? Live? Yeah, it's my city. Oh, what the heck? See, that's, that, that can't be an accident. <laughs> Here is, here's the problem with this, Chris. We're live. We can't cut out your shit just randomly when you talk over me. So this okay. is a lot of this stuff has to stay now. This is permanent. This is the negative of recording in the same room. I'm terrified. Yeah. 
So uh, a lot of people have been in this situation where they've hit the ceiling in their city and they've thought it's time to move if I want to do this at a, at a high level. A, how did you decide between Nashville, LA, New York, you know, some of the major cities, what made you go to LA? And then once you get that out of the mm. way, what pushed you over the hump of the fear that it takes to actually make that move? Because that is terrifying for most people. A, I love warm weather and in California. <laughs> That's the end of that. I get it. B, we made the move. We made the decision months in advance and we had savings and we did not burn our ships by just going out broke because I knew that if we came out here, it was going to need to be a full-time job of networking, coffee meetings, yeah, sending emails out, running around town, hustling, not sleeping, meeting everyone, mm. befriending everyone. So the, this was, you made the decision. Yep. And you said, we are going to do it. How long, of, how long in advance did you like say, all right, on X date, we're moving. Well, the small factor that was involved was that my then girlfriend, Stella, works in the corporate world and we need to give notice for her job and begin to look. And we were convinced that this was a difficult market to break into. So she said, I could start sending resumes out now, but it might be up to a year before anything would bite. But she's very humble. She has a master's degree and just was a ridiculous student and she's brilliant. And within a week, she had three offers. Okay, oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, she flew out and did some interviews and got hooked up at a great consulting firm. And so we came out uh, literally like six weeks after we spawned okay. the idea. So that made the, that made the decision a lot easier because you, wow. you had a gig lined up. Yep. She, and and, and it, that takes a lot of the stress away. Yeah, and I was able to still be mixing a lot of the projects I was working on. Specifically, I had this 52-song rock opera that I had been engineering for the past like eight months. Mm. And it was corporately funded and it was so i spent like the next four months mixing Wait, it how did you get that gig i'm just curious that's a very bizarre type of project to get uh, and that, i'm that, sure people would like to hear this story <laughs> that was a nepotism thing my dad that was a client of my dad's uh, he retired from the studio world and kind of gave me a lot of those contacts huh. so they they kept working with me and we did the thing i knew the system i knew how he did the job and kept it alive so that's amazing yeah okay so you move out to la Tell us what you did next to kind of get your foot in the door with some of the studios in LA. Right. So the first couple of weeks was failed attempt after failed attempt to get a hold of studio managers by dropping off resumes, emailing resumes, calling, mm. trying to get a hold of anybody, trying to find people who know someone who works at the studio and get an in. And this is what most people do, by the way, right? Yeah. And I, I didn't have a, a school type of counselor who could reach out. And so I didn't have that resource to, to make those connections. And so I was starting at the very, very bottom, mm. starting over and, and ground zero. Yeah. And trying to apply and get these, get like a minimum wage studio job to just start meeting bands and musicians coming through. And that was my, that was my goal. So when that wasn't working and I was just dead in the water, I, I filled up my Jeep full of boxes of donuts, like f floor to seat to ceiling. Uh, I think it was like 10 dozen boxes of these donuts and slapped my resume to the top printed in full color. It was just flashy and obnoxious. Yes. And these were expensive, don't like really, really nice donuts from a great place. And What's it called? What's, sh shout out the place. I do not remember. Huh. I actually had to make two stops. I ran out of boxes and resumes like halfway through the day. So I stopped somewhere else and <laughs> I'm obsessed with this story. This is awesome. So just studio by studio, dropping off donuts. I went to every single studio in the Valley and a few others that were kind of down in central LA, but I wanted to stick in the Valley, like some of the just iconic rooms. And just you sprinkling know. LA with your yeah. resume. Yeah. And, and did you just drop it and leave? Did you try to talk to anybody? Did you do like... I would ring doorbells. I would come in. I'd give them the pitch like, hey, uh, I want to come in and work hard for you guys. I'm, I'm hungry. And... I love your room. It meant a lot to me growing up. These were the records were made here and I, I meant it. Huh. There was yeah, nothing yeah. disingenuous about the locations I selected. Uh, they made records that inspired me. They had uh, engineers there that inspired me and I meant it. Dude, that's so dope. Uh, one of the things that drives me nuts is when you talk to somebody that's super, super young and trying to break in and, and they say like, oh, I just want to work in music. <laughs> I don't really care. I just want to work in music. I'm like, blah but yeah to have like a personal connection and be honest and have a story and be like this place this record your work impacted my life and is a part of who i am and also bri yeah. bribes help and bribes help yeah sugary bribes help yep <laughs> and uh i have a few friends that i way later down the line learned we're working there at some of those studios that day and and they're like dude you were the donuts guy i remember yeah. that we, we loved that, man. We, you were a, you found a way to, instead of being like every other damn kid who's fresh to the city and like 
sending out resumes blindly and like call, cold calling people. Instead, you found a way to become a purple cow. Totally. Well, and let me dig into that a little deeper. What I'm hearing you say is your buddies knew who you were and they're like, oh, he's a donut guy. I would imagine that while you weren't there, that a conversation with the manager or the head engineer or whatever, that it was easy for them to endorse you as a person to say, oh yeah, dude, Jesse's awesome, man. Donut guy, we go back. He's awesome. He would be great here. That's so much easier for your friends to give you a recommendation than for them to be like, oh, excuse me, sir. I have this friend. He's very talented. He's very hardworking. People don't do that. You have to give them an excuse to talk about you while you're not there and say nice things. So what you did, I'm, I'm struck with how clever it is. I'm going to pause right here and say there's a mermaid swimming in the pool below us the right hell now. There, oh my gosh. There is an actual, <laughs> guys, this is Los Angeles. She's not doing so well. She's struggling. Oh yeah, she can barely be tread a, water. There will be a clip of this. Oh, on she's our, diving. Oh wow, there it is. She's oh wow, doing great. that is so impressive. There will be a clip of this on our Instagram. <laughs> if you go to the Six Figure Home Studio on Instagram, uh, there will be a clip of the mermaid oh, from this you. interview. Nam, 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 nam. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I'll give you. I'll send you this clip. That's my first mermaid. I'll send you a clip of that video, Chris, and you can put it on our Instagram. Please our first, do. Our first post. Yeah, we're actually gonna be posting stuff on Instagram for like. Six figure home studio. So apparently that's a thing that people do. So stay tuned for more of that. So you've passed out all these donuts to these places, giving them sugary, sugary bribes. You could have worn a mermaid costume when you showed up. <laughs> that would have really made you memorable. Very purple. Hindsight is twenty twenty, man. <laughs> so what happened next? Truthfully, I, I was laughed at. I was called a goofball. I, I was ringing doorbells and, and, you know, usually it's these gates that, mm. that these studios are back behind. So, you know, you ring the intercom and then you have to go in and yeah, I got laughed at and I didn't get called back. And it was the very last studio of the day. I thought, well, it's sun's going down. Huh. I'll pick up again tomorrow. There's more. Uh, I hit the last spot. It was NRG in North Hollywood. Jay Baumgartner's room uh, where they did pretty much all the new metal recordings of like the early 2000s and a lot of the Howard Benson stuff happened there and it was mm. extremely influential for isn't this where all the slate samples were recorded yeah, as absolutely well? oh yeah, yeah yeah yep a lot of the like first two generations of his sample releases were there yeah I walked right in and the they loved it I'm like okay yeah you you got it so I joined their like three month internship program and then after three weeks they just hired me on and I became a runner and mm. So you had to try, you did, did this a bunch of times. It didn't work on the first time. It wasn't a donut hole in one. Perseverance. <laughs> ah, man. <laughs> <sighs> how do you deal with this guy? I don't, I don't know how I deal with this, with myself. It's, I feel bad for you. How mind. do you sleep at night? Not very well. I just lay there. By the way, Chris Graham snores. Just so everyone, I want you to be aware that I have a clip of Sorry. your snoring as well that we can put on the podcast. Okay, too. that sounds great. No, I'm not going to do that Can to someone you. make it into a song on the podcast? That would be not pleasant. <laughs> what? Well, we got shit. We got two mermaids There's two now. Oh mermaids. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cuss. There we are have, two fucking mermaids, there's two fucking in, mermaids the pool. in the pool. But yeah, there's two people. There's two mermaids. With like a mermaid suit. Where do you buy a mermaid suit? At the... You Score. know what? I'm going to go ahead and say at Disneyland across the street. They definitely went to Disneyland today and bought mermaid costumes, which is funny because there's so many people here at Nam that aren't even doing Disney. They're just walking the Nam floor saying, look at this stuff. Isn't it neat? Wouldn't you think that my life's complete? Wouldn't you think I'm the girl? Do not fucking look at me. Who has everything. It's my wife's favorite song, man. You can tell. You can tell. Freak. It's a jam. You can tell who here has kids and who doesn't. <laughs> my kids haven't watched The Little Mermaid yet. This is. I'm reciting this from from my childhood, sir. All right. Sorry. So let's get back to the story here. You've passed all these donuts out. How many boxes of donuts did you think you delivered that? Was it in one day, two days? How long did it take to? It do was this? one day. One day. Okay. Yeah, I was out for about eight hours. Uh, it was like 14 or 15 boxes of donuts. So I had to like throw down a couple hundred bucks. Mm. And, you know. I'm going to fist bump you for that move. That's amazing. I just love that it was the last one you went to. Yeah. Well, I suppose if I had not like taken the job there, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't have left that studio and be like, oh, I'm going to try some other studios. I was tired. It was so you got, you got the job that day. You walked in and were like, hey, check it out. And they were like, you're hired in Hollywood at a famous studio. 
Yeah, and it was great. Huh. And I went on to work there and really learn about LA session flow and the speed of things, which was extremely different and than the way I'd known about things huh. and and kind of the dynamic of knowing when to speak and when not to and when you're allowed to contribute to the creativity of a session and and really when you're not. And I had thought that I would, you know, I'd been making records for like almost 10 years and mm. like, oh, I kind of know what I'm doing, but I also want to be humble and be quiet. But like, no, I, I did get put in my place mm. uh, from a few of the guys there that, that knew what was up and mm. they really wanted to, to make sure that I didn't fail. <laughs> so like, Hey man, I love you, bro. But you know, now, now's not the time. So I, I, I listened Yeah, and there are so many moments that would follow after I left that studio really, really quickly because I got picked up with the engineering and mixing thing around town. And ultimately that was the move was to pivot away from that studio. But yeah, I used those lessons I learned there and am still using them all the time. That's awesome, man. It's a great story. So let's talk about from picking up from that point. When did you start to gain traction in LA? I befriended a few guys that were tracking engineers that were pivoting into producing and mixing and they didn't want the, the tracking gigs anymore. And that's kind of the, uh, the hierarchy. So, mm. um, a few really great guys were throwing work to me and suggesting me to other studio managers. And that ultimately led to the opportunity to go in and sub in one night for an artist named Tyga doing uh, tracking rap, Never heard of rap vocals <laughs> at Nightbird. I've heard of him. <laughs> well, see, it, it's not my style of music. And at huh. the time I was like, yeah, I've heard of this guy. I know yeah. nothing about it. So I listened to it for a couple hours and then went in and, and yeah, we had a great time. We tracked for like five hours and it's like, cool. This is a very chill session. Uh, how cool I'm getting to make music and, and charge a day rate in LA. Like this is beautiful. And awesome. towards the end of the night, Kanye West walks into the room and huh. they're, they're buddies. So they're hanging out and, and we're all kind of making music together. And I'm just like, I have to capitalize on this. I'm going to get fired from the studio and never get invited back, but I need to speak up and try to work for that guy. Mm. And I was going for about three or four more hours. We went late into the morning and I was texting my wife like, Kanye's here. I need to, I need to try to make this opportunity happen. I need to work for but this at, guy. At the time you were playing a cool. I was playing a cool. You were, you were staying in place. You were like, Showing that you can hang, you know when to talk and when not to talk, you know when to leave, mm. lay back and let them do their thing. Yes, I'm glad you said that. The role of a tracking engineer in the hip hop world is that you are silent. Like uh. you don't speak, you don't contribute ideas unless you are asked, but you are there to serve. And I mean, that's been what my parents taught me from the beginning. Like you are here to serve. What can you do to bring value to our others and mm. to artists and Love it. the people that you work with? That's what we're here to do. And that's our contribution to this mm. planet. That's what we do, Jess. <laughs> that's my, I'm hearing my dad's voice right now. Uh, except he's got a little more scruff with the mustache. He sounds kind of <laughs> like a cowboy. He smokes a pack of days. He's that's that kind of guy. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So towards the end of the night, Kanye was packing up to leave. He, he was getting tired. And I was like, no, I missed the chance. He went, he left to go down the hall to use the restroom and then leave. And I thought, I'm doing it. I got up out of the chair. Way, way, way red flag. Don't do that in a session while you're working. <laughs> I got up and I walked out. I ran, I chased him down the hall. I cornered him at the end of the hall. And I said, dude, I am so out of line here, but I will never be able to live with myself if I do not tell you that I admire your work. And I would love to come work for you if you need somebody, huh. if you need an engineer. And there was a moment where he free, he, he froze and he turned his head and just looked at me mean. And I'm like, oh man, I'm going to get punched in the face right now. <laughs> and then he said, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let me get your number. And Whoa. his team got a hold of me the next day. They flew me to Chicago and we started. Holy hell. And uh, I got to meet one of my good buddies. Uh, Zach Jurek was his other engineer huh. at the time. And we worked together just taking turns tracking and we traveled to Uganda and we, we made music out at a safari and, and there mm. were hippos running around and it was wild. And yeah, I, wow. It just, it kind of all took off from there. We talk about the similarities between business and dating a lot on this podcast, but that strikes me as something that resonates is like when you're, this is something I experienced a lot in my twenties is like hanging out with a girl, things are mm. going great. And then you miss that opportunity to like get her number, ask her out, yeah. like do something to like, to push that relationship to the next level. And then the opportunity is gone forever. You never see yeah. her again. This was what you were experiencing with Kanye West. You had to put, you had to put yourself way out of your comfort zone, 
potentially put yourself out of a job for crossing lines that you shouldn't really cross in the studio, but the upside was too great to pass up on that opportunity, but you had to get the courage to get past that fear to see what's on the other side. And I think, I think that's a lot of, a lot of people struggle to do that, to get past the fear of potential rejection and not just rejection, yeah. but complete annihilation from this <laughs> career field. Cause you did this to Kanye West yeah. in one of the main studios in LA an artist who is notorious for blacklisting individuals who crossed him the wrong way. Mm. I could have never been hired again in this town. Yeah. Easily. <laughs> I had to try. I had to try huh. because we have all lived with those types of yeah. moments of regret. We're like, what would have happened? Huh. I, I never took the shot. Well, that is the worst feeling. I'm so curious. Like after you had the interaction with Kanye, did you walk back down the hall or go back into the studio and get a look from somebody else that worked at the studio of like, really? Yeah. The manager that, that hired me, he heard about what had happened. He had already left, but he texted me the next morning, heard about last night, dot, dot, dot. And that was the headline of the text. And I've opened up to read the full text and it was how exciting, man. Go get it. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> like, well, oh. Your heart sank for a oh. second. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how do you, okay, let's talk about this though. How do you know when it's an opportunity that you should jump on Ooh. and when it's crossing the line. Well, a little extra detail in this story is that he had mentioned really, really quietly earlier in the night to somebody that he was speaking to that he may be bringing on more engineer oh, snap. individuals huh. because he needs some help for a trip they were going to be taking to Bali and a trip to Uganda. And I heard it like back, 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 back of the room. Huh. I'm recording vocals. I'm with the artist. I'm focused. But I'm also, I, I had an agenda of knowing what was going on with this guy. This was a ticket in and I wanted to be involved. So I heard that. That set me over the edge. That was like, there it is. He's going to hire more engineers huh. I'm right here. He, we, we've been vibing all night. Let's do it. Amazing. Let's go I, think, for it. I think there's, there are some points in my life that are similar to this where it's almost like when you're looking back over the highlights, there are periods when you are just almost stuck in a rut. You're just kind of coasting and it feels like you're not doing shit with your life. And then there are these key opportunities that come up that if you fail to capitalize, you've just guaranteed another year of coasting and nothing's going to happen. Mm, yeah. But then if you trace back where you are now to where you were, there were two or three opportunities that you took advantage of in your storyline that completely changed the trajectory of your life. One was moving to LA, one was giving out donuts to <laughs> random studios, and then one was taking the opportunity to work with Kanye. I'm struck by, there are probably, and I don't mean this in an offensive way at all, but there are probably a lot of guys that are as talented as you are. Oh, way more talented. But you have bigger marbles. And that, it sounds to me like that was the difference. You had the guts to take risks and to put yourself in a position where there was upside and downside. And I, I see so many young people in not just our industry, but in every industry that are just unwilling to take any risk. Everything is, how do I play it safe? How do I keep from getting embarrassed? And this is like a middle school, high school mentality, you know, of like, oh, I'm not going to, what if they laugh at me? You know, like. And I mean, I just commend you for that. Like these are, these are incredible stories. Thanks, man. Well, I, I hope if there's anything that all the other engineers listening can take away from this is that you can, <laughs> you can do it. And, yeah. and I encourage you to, uh, but there's a way to go about it. And I think it's, it is to avoid shooting people, walking up to that band, breaking the barrier mm. between audience and stage and saying, Hey, you guys should record with me, man. While the confidence is cool. I think the approach is wrong. And the approach is not to talk about me like while I'm selling to you and trying to convince you to record with me, yeah. it's not to tell you how awesome I am. It's to present you with what value I can bring to you. I'm like, man, we can, we can make this experience awesome. I hear what you guys are going for with this sound. Like I love Led Zeppelin. I, I, I studied the Glenn Johns method. Like I think I could help you guys get that sound that you're really trying to, I can tell you want that sound and I don't think the records are there. Like I'm, I hope you'll appreciate my honesty. Like I've said that to so many bands. Like mm. I know what you're going for. And even if I don't understand what they're going for, I will then I'll go home from saying that and I'll study it for a week <laughs> and then I'll mock something up and send it to him. But like, dude, check this out. Is that close? Like, yeah. I, I, if it isn't, I would love to have you over. Let's do it together. Let's tweak this. Let's tweak this compressor. Do you still we, do this today? Yes. 
I have every mixed client come over if, if they're able to, if they live in LA, like come to the studio, let's work together. We're going to have fun. We'll bake cookies. We'll, we'll get all the goodies ready. A lot of this reminds me of you asking your wife out on your first day. Oh, I'm thinking yes. the same yeah, thing. It's yeah, that yeah. like specific that offer you're creating so that it's not just, hey, come record with me. Will you be my <laughs> girlfriend? <laughs> or, yeah. Will you be my girlfriend? It is like, I am going to do this. This is the specific thing you're going to get. And we're going to sweeten the deal because of literally sweet things like cookies or donuts. And we're going to get the thing that you want out of it, which is this specific sound, or mm. this specific vibe. Uh, and I just love that that is the approach you take. Yeah, I mean, I'm struck by kind of two things, two characteristics I see about you. One is your courage. Clearly, you have a lot of courage. You're willing to take risks. You're willing to risk embarrassing yourself. And that sets you apart. Not many people are willing to do that. And then the second is you have a lot of faith in yourself. And these two things obviously overlap and have clearly impacted the decisions that you've made. I think about people listening to this show that are, are trying to get a foot in the industry or build a career or grow their business or whatever. And I think you can make a list of like, what, am I, what are my assets from a skill perspective? And then what are my, what are my issues? This is something I talk about when I'm, I'm coaching people a lot of figuring out like, what's the stuff that's not going well? What are the bottlenecks? And what are the superhero abilities? And you can make a list of all these things like, well, I'm really good at EQ. Oh, I'm really good at like, you know, plugging in wires and stuff. And oh, I'm, you know, I'm pretty good at like fast revisions. Like you could do all this list of all these things. And inevitably you have to look at like, what are your strengths that could leverage you into success the most? What are the things that you can do that nobody else can? Because that's where you can add the most value. But then also, what are the things that you need to work on? What are the things that are holding you back? And like my story with Chris Graham Mastering was when I started reading business books, it was four hour work week. And I mentioned this in the podcast a million times, read chapter five and four hour work week about the 80, 20 principle, put it down and was like, I need to learn how to automate all the crap in my business. That's not making art and figured out like, that's the bottleneck. I don't possess this skill. And I think I'm hoping for a lot of people listening to the show, the take home might be for them that the skill you need to work on is courage and faith in yourself. Those are- And people skills. And people skills. <laughs> and people, well, that's, yeah, you're right. There, there's actually a Venn diagram of three things going on here. There's courage, self-confidence, and clearly people skills. And I think as you're doing an assessment, I'm talking to our listeners now, as you're doing an assessment of- what are your character assets? That needs to be a new word on the show. What are your character assets? And what are your, what's the opposite of an asset? What are your character liabilities? And figuring out how to minimize your character liabilities. Man, courage, people skills, and faith in yourself. Whoo, those are potent. Potent, yes. Like capable of overcoming a multitude of sins. You know, a multitude of character liabilities. Yeah, man, this is awesome. You're great. I like you. Hey, I like you guys too, man. <laughs> Super happy to be here. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks we're glad to have me. you, man. It's so weird to just like have met you over Instagram and now we're hanging out at Nam. And Jesse, you've listened to the podcast before. Is there anything in particular that jumps out to you of, man, I wish Chris and Brian would talk about this. I, there's one piece of advice that you could give to our audience as far as building a career that has stability longevity, profitability, all these things. If you had to give like your, I don't know, your little brother, your best friend advice, like here's what I would do. Pretend, you know, this person's in the room, kind of give us that advice on, on building a career as quickly and as effectively as you have. Can I ask you a question that might help shape uh, yeah, sure. the, the angle that this would take? Um, because you do all the coaching and I, I think you speak to a lot more up and comers than I do. Mm. What do you see as one of the biggest hurdles that they need to overcome right now what what are th Ooh, what are they running the into tables have turned oh, man i like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think it's kind of what i was talking about earlier is people not recognizing what their superhero strength is people not recognizing their character asset so yeah i mean i think that's that's the big thing of not recognizing i bring this to the table and i can help people with that and we talk about this on the show all the time but this idea of like service are you a servant are you trying to help people rather than be the champion, rather than like, we were talking earlier today at lunch about our breakfast, however you want to frame that. It's we're known all, as brunch. It's brunch. Yeah. We were brunching. <laughs> but this idea of like, you know, Elon Musk says we're in a simulation. And I think the tricky thing with that simulation is like, 
am I the only human in the simulation and everybody else's software? <laughs> like there's a, there's an inherently potentially selfish outlook on that. What the hell does that have to do with audio engineering? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, yeah, I'm, kind of I know. I'm like, I'm way out Where there. Where is that going? Man? I'm way out there. But like the idea here is that if we're in a simulation, you are either a user or you're part of the game. And from a business standpoint, you will be much more successful seeing yourself as a character in a game designed to help the person who's playing that game. So we're way down a weird rabbit hole with this, and I kind of regret getting yeah, too I'm metaphysical. Like, I can jump in. Okay, do it, do it, do cool. it. Well, I see a common thread across every single successful person in every industry. Here we go. And I think that it is complete, just in, in their nature, they're, they're genuinely interested in giving and providing a service and providing value mm. for their customers. And I think that because as custom, we are all customers, when somebody isn't genuine and they're trying to sell us something, you get the hard sale or that you, we can sniff it out like, like wolves, man. Oh yeah. It's gross. It like, like I walk by some of the booths here at NAM and here, uh, take the pamphlet. And did you know that you can win a hundred? Like, Oh, I, I, it gives me the creeps. It, mm. It's just, and everybody, I think that's a, that's a pretty universal feeling. I would just do some soul searching and just ask yourself, like, do you love what you're doing? And do you truly want to help the planet be a better sounding place? Do you want to contribute mm. to the art that is happening here? And do you want to be a part of the better good and the cause of making it just sonically improve over time? And, and it's not just about sonics, but do you want to help those artists tell those stories? Yeah. Tell those stories that are going to give, well, whether someone's listening to a song in their car and with their AirPods pro or in a house of worship, like, I want someone to get goosebumps. I want them to feel something. I want them to reflect and, and let the negative energy out. Are, are you a part of that? Are you helping that mm. be achieved? Are you helping get that to the listener? Yeah. Or are you interested in that? Oh, or man. are you just trying to collect a paycheck? Or are you just trying to get paid? Like that's gross and people will sniff it out. And if that's the case, yeah. I don't know if I would suggest like professional help or, or <laughs> reading, maybe read How to Win Friends and Influence Others because that yeah, yeah. that is a great book that, that can help somebody who has the right intentions to just hone in on those a, a little bit more. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that would be a good start. Man, this is honestly something I've been struggling with a little bit. You know, I built a career as a mastering engineer. I love mastering. We we're talking about this earlier, but as Bounce Butler takes off and, and frankly, business coaching has been, it was one of the highlights of 2019 for me. And it's kind of on that. This has been frustrating for me as the podcast has taken off and being like, Oh, I've, I don't know if mastering is the way that I can help the most people the most. And I think figuring out success probably on some level is answering that question. How do you help the most people the most? That's where you're going to be able to provide the most value. And uh, I'm processing that. I'm not, I'm not completely sure what I think. And this is certainly not me turning in my resignation as a mastering engineer, <laughs> but uh, I love it. But it's, it's definitely like seeing your, that story that you posted about Bounce Butler and like, oh my gosh, you got to hang out with your daughter for an extra hour. Whoa, that's like, no one gets to hang out with their kids more because I mastered their record, you know? So I'm processing this and, and what you're saying of just like serving other people. I think mean, there is a component of figuring out, I guess, what your purpose is, but at the same time, also figuring out this life of service, how to help the most people the most. And I think I've mentioned this on the, on the podcast before, this is weird, but like one of the things I've been kind of contemplating and you always make fun of me for, I make, I make fun of you for a lot of you things. You do, you do. But so like- <laughs> That's kind of our stick. <laughs> uh, my story's weird because I was like born and raised Catholic and then I became an atheist for a long time and made fun of Christians. It was like my number one favorite thing to right. do. And now you just like to not wear deodorant so your pits sweat a lot. That's yeah. also true. But at, at one point uh, I like became a Christian, became a born again Christian, which was super weird as an atheist. But so I'm fascinated by Jesus. And one of the things he says- uh, it's like the disciples are fighting. And again, I'm not trying to get preachy here. I'm just, I'm pointing out that this is interesting and applicable to what we're talking about. But the disciples are fighting about, Jesus is like bros are fighting about like, who's the greatest among them, which is like, oh guys, come on. That's such an audio engineer yeah, argument. Uh, I think I'm a, my ears are far more better than yours. Uh, my high end response. But what Jesus says to them is like, the, he, I think they ask him like point blank, like which one of us is the greatest? And he straight up says, like, the greatest among you is one, last, 
and two, the servant of all. And I'm just trying to understand what that means, but it has a lot of application for what we talk about this, on this podcast of like how this go-giver mentality, this service mentality, this hero's journey mentality of like, how do you support the hero in the story rather than like, I just want a career in audio. Would you hire me? It's my dream. And, and when I'm asking, Oh God, the dream, yeah, the dream argument, you it's should hire my, me because it's, it's my, my dream. dream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That will never work. <laughs> yeah. No, thanks. So yeah, I mean, Jesse, I'm, I'm like fascinated by your, I'm going to use the word gumption. I was going to say, that's the word. Gumption. It's, gumption's the only, there's a great word yeah. to use here. Chutzpah. You got, you got those things, man. Like you grounded out and you took risks and man, I commend you. You're a badass. Thank you. <laughs> Six figure home studio salute Woo. to you, Jesse Ray. So that is it for this episode of the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast. If you're wondering why my voice sounds so awkward and kind of quiet and way less energetic than normal, it's because that my normal environment for recording a podcast has changed. I am no longer in my studio in the privacy of a well soundproof room. Instead, I am sitting here with my wife on a bed. She's watching Modern Family and uh, the hotel we're in, the walls are paper thin. So I just feel all kinds of awkward in here. Do you have anything you want to say, Megan? <laughs> Hello, world. This is really awkward. Yeah, so she's, I just put her on the spot there. So uh, we are in Chiang Mai, Thailand, which is northern Thailand right now, and uh, recording this outro here. And uh, it, was, it was awesome to hear back this episode because Jesse Ray is someone that Chris had met and Chris had talked to, and I had really hadn't gotten to know him until we hung out at NAM. And uh, it was awesome to hear his story on how much he hustled to get where he is today. And to see what taking leaps of faith like that gets you, which is recording an album in Uganda with Kanye West. Uh, I think that's a really awesome story to, to see where that kind of stuff can lead. Next week's episode, I don't know what it's going to be because Chris and I really don't talk a lot because of the time difference here. It's like a 12 hour time difference. So when it's 6.15 PM here, which it is right now, as I record this, it's 6.15 AM in Ohio where Chris is. So. Uh, It'll be a surprise next week, bright and early, 6 a.m. when that episode airs, what it will be. My guess is it will either be an interview or it'll be a co-hosted episode with Andy J. Pizza. Either way, it'll be awesome. So uh, tune in for that. Meanwhile, I will still be uh, on my workation for the next few weeks here in Thailand. And I think next we're going to go to Vietnam or maybe the southern Thailand, go to islands down there. Uh, but I do know that in the morning, we leave to go to the Elephant Rescue Park where mistreated elephants go to basically be rehabilitated. And uh, it's kind of like an interesting way to do elephant tourism here in a much more ethical way that's not hurting the elephants, not riding the elephants. And yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, excuse my unenergetic voice here as I awkwardly record this outro next to my wife. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. 